Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Dr. Joy Wolfram is a researcher at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science in Jacksonville, Florida. She was recently named to the Forbes magazine annual list of 30 under 30. Big deal. It's impressive. The magazine describes those on that list as the brashest entrepreneurs across the United States and Canada who are putting a new twist on the old tools of the trade and shaking up some of the world's stodgiest (laughs) industries. So what is it that she's doing that's so innovative and exciting? Let's find out. Joining us on the phone from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, is Dr. Joy Wolfram. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Dr. Wolfram, congratulations. That's a, it's a wonderful honor. So I want to go back to your childhood because apparently you were always a curious kid. Exactly. I was always very curious about everything around me. <laughs> and tell us some of the stories about when you were growing up. Well, there's one that I remember really clearly and it was when I was 11 years old and my dog had a skin infection uh, so we rushed her to the vet and there I saw them doing some um, petri dishes tests so they took some swabs from her skin and put it into these bacterial culture plates. I thought that was fascinating. I asked the vet can I take some of these supplies home to do my own experiments and she looked at me sort of (laughs) like I'm crazy. (laughs) Crazy kid, yeah. Exactly. But in the end, she did uh, hand me a bag full of these supplies and sort of whispered, don't tell anyone. (laughs) And that night I went home and started my own uh, miniature microbiology lab in my room. And one of the first experiments I did was to swab um, refrigerator (laughs) shelves. And it was amazing results. In a few days, you had all these colors and shapes form and of course all I was these fascinated. bacteria growing exactly. on the petri dish yeah <laughs> exactly. out of your refrigerator and i called my family into my room and said you know <laughs> look at this back all these bacteria and they were horrified but actually our fridge wasn't unusually dirty it's just that science is unusually cool and there's all these worlds out there that we can't really experience unless we use these scientific tools so that's, that sort of drove me to later pursue a bachelor master's and a phd in in biomedical sciences. So you put a new twist on the old tools of the trade. How do most scientific breakthroughs happen, and what did you do that was so different? Exactly. So um, what's surprising is that 99% of what we do in science actually fails. So it's a lot about resiliency and uh, to keep trying, even if we're not getting the results we're expecting. But sort of the thing uh, that my team has done and that my colleagues have done is thinking about cancer in a different way. So we spent $100 billion or more just in the U.S. on cancer research in the last 70 years. Um, And still we have certain types of cancer where the survival rates haven't really changed. Mm -hmm. So how can we approach this from a different perspective and how can we use nanotechnology and, for instance, physics um, to study cancer and develop new tools? And when you say nanotechnology, tell us what you mean by that. To me, it means small. Exactly. So it's like tiny little cars that we can inject into the blood, and we can uh, load these cars with passengers, and the passengers are the cancer drugs. And this will help the cancer drugs get to the tumor instead of going everywhere in the body. And so we have higher uh, therapeutic efficacy and also reduced side effects, usually when we're using these tiny nano particles. So you load the the nanoparticles with something that will will kill the the cancer. Exactly. So usually we can use standard chemotherapeutic agents, so cancer drugs that are already used in the clinic, but this way we're able to improve their transport within the body. I've heard about this with viruses, like using viruses to fight cancer. Is that what you're doing? Are you attaching these nano nanoparticles to viruses? It's similar because viruses are actually the same size as the nanoparticles we use. Um, But instead of using viruses, we're making them up from uh, other types of materials. Some are synthetic and others are actually from our own bodies. Have you used this in the the clinical setting yet? So we haven't uh, because usually it takes 12 years to get something from the bench to the medicine cabinet. But others have. So there's uh, more than 10 clinically approved nanoparticles for cancer. Uh, in the U.S. Um, those are pretty simple nanoparticles, and so my team and others around the world are working to get um, 
more innovative nanoparticles into the clinic, but they're already there. Um, from your standpoint, uh, what what are your value? What's your most important value as a researcher? It's a great question. I think it's service. So I think as leaders, uh, we are servers. So I ask myself, how can I serve my team members? How can I serve patients, community community members and colleagues. So that's really, really what we do. You, you have a, a bit of an accent. Uh, <laughs> yes. D- you came from where? Uh, I was born in Finland, um, but I also spent some of my childhood in the UK. And then how did you get to the US? So um, I was studying biology, and I thought about, you know, thinking, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about cancer in a different way. So I got some funding from my home country in Finland and looked at where are the best places in the world um, to do nanotechnology from a translational uh, patient-focused perspective. And um, where I initially went was the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. And there they had this uh, new nano department inside a hospital. So similar to the great uh, resources we have at Mayo Clinic. And then how did you get to Mayo? Then after I uh, graduated with my PhD, um, which was in collaboration with the Texas Medical Center in China, I started my own lab at at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Wow. So are you going to continue pursuing the cancer avenue with nanomedicine or what else are you you looking at? Exactly. So we have two main uh, directions in the lab. And one is cancer and the second is regenerative medicine. So how can we develop new nanoparticles that can help organs that are damaged. Huh. So uh, you obviously have, have had some success in the field of research, and uh, Forbes magazine recognized that fact. Do you, for the young people out there, uh, and in particular young women, do you have a, a recipe for success? Well, I think it's definitely resilience. So as minorities uh, in science, it's rarely... Um, Neutral. It's either a disadvantage or an advantage, and usually it's a disadvantage. So we really have to be resilient, uh, resilient, and keep um, uh, supporting each other. And we also need support from the majority. So never give up. And uh, you know, we need more minority leaders in science. So we need you, Dr. Wolfram. I was just going to ask. I've got teenagers, and so often what I hear is the the jobs that they will have when they're done with college don't even really exist yet. Is it? going that quickly? Is it that fast from your perspective? I I think it is. There's a lot of new fields emerging like artificial intelligence and so on that will play a role in, uh, you know, biomedical therapies. Um, But one thing that I'm very excited regarding the future of nanomedicine are these biological nanoparticles. So all of us actually have a lot of nanoparticles in our bodies. And a new area to explore is how can we exploit these biological nanoparticles for therapeutic purposes. And I think one of the areas is regenerative medicine. So I think a lot of the teenagers today will be probably involved in those types of applications in the future that are not really clear to us yet how that will look like. And how do we do that? Do you know, do you have a theory on how that, how to do that? Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, outreach, us getting into schools, getting kids excited about science and so that they're ready to take on those new challenges uh, as tec- technology evolves. When you daydream, what do you think about? Do you think? Do you ultimately hope that nanotechnology will prove to be a cure for cancer? Well, absolutely. Of course, everything we do is to to benefit patients. Um, but I had three main goals, and and the first is that I dream about uh, making a difference for patients, getting some of our therapies actually into clinical use, and the second is developing future leaders. So if I can help develop for instance, minority leaders that then go on to inspire others, then that's having a really uh, big impact that goes beyond just myself. And then, of course, thirdly, is um, removing bias against minorities in science. Impressive. Yeah. Well, she's recently been named to the Forbes magazine annual list of 30 under 30 for her work in nanomedicine. Truly an emerging researcher to watch, revolutionizing targeted cancer treatments to potentially help millions of people who die of the disease every year. Dr. Wolfram, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.